This is a book saying there are Black people who need help, and the people who are calling themselves Black people's saviors now don't understand this, but they're hurting Black people because what they're caught up in is more about virtue signaling to one another than helping people who actually need help. In his best-selling new book, Woke Racism, How a New Religion Has Betrayed Black America, New York Times columnist and Columbia University linguist John McWhorter argues that the ideas of Robin DiAngelo, Ibram X. Kendi, and the 1619 Project undermine blacks by sharpening racial divides and distracting from actual obstacles to real progress. Reason spoke with the 56-year-old McWhorter about what whites get out of cooperating with an ideological agenda that casts them as devils, what blacks gain by performing victimhood, and what needs to change so that all Americans can get on with creating a more perfect union. John McWhorter, thanks for talking to Reason. My pleasure, Nick. Good to see you again. Thank you. Uh, let's uh, get right to woke racism, how a new religion has betrayed black America. What's the elevator pitch for woke racism? Well, the elevator pitch is that there is a group of people who are committed to what they call social justice, and they are certain enough of their moral purity that they are willing to hurt other people if they don't agree with their principles. And their notion is that they are saving people who are living under the power of the white hegemony. So a lot of this is about race. A lot of it is about Black people. The problem with it is not only are these people mean, not only are these people unpleasant to deal with, but in the name of social justice for Black people, they often either don't care about Black people for real, or they're hurting Black people. And so I wrote Woke Racism not as some boring statement from the right wing about family values and people pulling themselves up by their own bootstraps. This is not what some people would think of as a John McWhorter book, although I've never written a book like that. This is a book saying there are Black people who need help, and the people who are calling themselves Black people's saviors now don't understand this, but they're hurting Black people because what they're caught up in is more about virtue signaling to one another than helping people who actually need help. You know, yeah, just very briefly, uh, you mentioned, you know, uh, people are going to say this is, you know, a right wing book or might expect it to be. What are your politics? My politics are 1960 liberal. Mm -hmm. If it were 1960, everybody would think of me as a normal liberal. I would be this Adlai Stevenson voting, pointy headed, as they used to put yeah, it. Yeah, pointed headed, into pointy headed intellectual. Right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. That's, that's me. Now, in the late 60s, an idea settles in that on race, radicalism is default. And therefore, I become a right winger because I don't have the politics of, say, Stokely Carmichael or Amiri Baraka. But I have never voted Republican. I could, but I never have. Mm -hmm. I consider my company to be left-leaning people who you know, read the New York Times and the Atlantic. I you know, teach at a university and have never felt out of place there, despite what some people but might But you think. do teach at a university that Eisenhower was the president of, right? So <laughs> it's practically part of true. the Koch brothers conspiracy, <laughs> I, I, I'm guessing. I don't know. Well, of course, you know, he's an Eisenhower Republican. It's funny, <laughs> his painting is, you know, right up in the library. But um, yeah, and so I consider myself to be of that world. I'm I'm not speaking from the right, but something has gone really wrong. I think something is really distracting people in my world lately into supposing that they're supposed to fall for a kind of purposeless extremism in order to be good people. So yeah, I'm talking to my people in both senses of that word. I'm talking to Black people, and I'm talking to New York Times reading, Blue America, people who saw sideways kinds of people. Why is it important that, uh, you know, you talk about woke racism and, you, and you're, you know, we're talking about woke activism. So this is Robin DiAngelo, Ibram Kendi, Ta-Nehisi Coates, uh, that sort of, you know, kind of universe. Why is it important that you uh, call it a religion? Why, why does it matter that it's religious in its sensibility? Yeah, I think that's being misunderstood. I predicted that 
my calling it a religion would irritate many people, especially religious people, because it's so clear that I have such contempt for this woke business, and therefore, what do I think of religion? And I call it a religion partly because of various formal similarities between it and especially devout Christianity, starting with white privilege as original sin. And I think that not only are those parallels important, but I have a heuristic reason for it. There's an extent to which I think some people were expecting woke racism to be this examination of the nature of religion and the nature of wokeness and what the parallels are and making an argument that wokeness is a religion in great detail. Let's face it, for one thing, nobody would have read that book. And two, they shouldn't have. It's not that important. I consider it useful to think of this as a religion so that people can understand that we can't we can't have productive exchanges with the particular kind of person I'm writing about. Many people think, well, if we could only get them to understand that we need a plurality of ideas. Well, if we could only get them to understand that, you know, you catch flies better with honey than with, what is that expression? You know, Vinegar. make them, yeah. right, <laughs> with honey. If we could only break bread with these people, or people ask me, how can I get that kind of person to not call me a racist? And the answer is, you can't. That's what they do. And they do it because they think that the whole issue is as simple as whether or not we're going to accept pedophilia. And so just as you're unlikely to try to convince somebody that Jesus does not love them, you're unlikely to try to talk someone out of their religious faith. It might work with the occasional person, but boy, that's a tough one. You can't talk anybody out of this new way of thinking from the hard, hard left. The idea is to walk around these people, and sometimes you have to learn to stand up to them. And framing it as a religion, I think, gets across that idea better than just calling it, say, an ideology. There's something different about this here. Um, you at one point refer to woke activists as our Pharisees. Um, refresh for the audience, and by which I mean myself, you know, why, <laughs> who were the Pharisees? I know they got a couple of the best songs in Jesus Christ Superstar. But other than that, you know, it's like I think that illusion might be lost on people, but it's important. Could you kind of uh, illustrate that a little? That's that one passage I wrote. What I meant by the Pharisees is that that particular tale highlights the difference between doing something because you're seen to do it and doing something because you wish to do it and you don't feel whole unless you do it. So it's basically a way of referring to virtue signaling while keeping the religious analogy going, meaning that a great deal of what we're seeing is people showing that they know that racism exists. And one particularly darling idea is to show that you know that racism can be systemic. That's what people get the high off of. But the overlap between that and helping people who need help is often not only partial, but very small. And so what you see is people gesturing and gesticulating and posturing. What I say in the book is that it's kind of like people who go to a village that you know has been inundated by a mudslide and they are putting pictures on Facebook of themselves pulling people out of the mud instead of just pulling people right. out of the mud. That's what we see. I'm not sure this fits into your schema, but next to Reason's office in DuPont Circle in D.C., there's a strip club. Uh, it's total coincidence that they're there. But on that strip club, uh, which is called Assets, um, it has a big sign that says Black Lives Matter. <laughs> um, is that the kind of virtue signaling you're talking about, or is it something more pernicious? Well, frankly, yes, in that what's going on there is that that club is trying to show that they understand that racism can be systemic. But then again, if just kind of putting that fist salute up is all they're doing, then it's Let's try this. There's nothing wrong with those people saying we agree with the premises of Black Lives Matter and by implication, this whole this and by implication, the racial reckoning and dealing with systemic racism. All that is is just fine. But if that is the soul of this entire racial reckoning, we're in trouble. I don't cringe when I see BLM signs, but the thing is a great many people pretend that they're doing anything other than that. So moment. if the assets management is actually redistributing tips towards black strippers rather than white or, and I guess Asian strippers lose in this too. That would be better, especially okay. if the people they're, they're dealing with are disadvantaged and could use the extra help. Although I wouldn't take them especially to task, but that signaling is the general feeling of this entire supposed racial reckoning. When you, you know, you critique the, the term systemic or systematic racism, uh, white supremacy, uh, we should talk a little bit about what people mean when they invoke white supremacy. But 
isn't uh i mean is it your contention that race uh racism which certainly was you know it was systemic i mean there was for most of the history of the united states uh there were laws that specifically and clearly said if you were black if you had one drop of black blood you're not you're not sitting here you're not eating here you're not working here you're not welcome here you're not learning here um are we past the age of systemic racism well, if we're talking about racism in the present tense, it's much harder to identify than racism in the past. I don't like that term, not because of the systemic, but because of the racism part. I think it's a real stretch of our cognition to go from racism being an attitude to racism referring to inequities within a system that are racial. And I think it's dangerous because you end up talking about inequities that are a very different nature and you refer to them all with the term racism, which implies that there's this one particular issue, and we can't help thinking that it's partly this emotion, this bias, and that therefore we can fight the racism. And it distracts our attention because we think, well, bigotry must be part of that in some way. And in general, all of these things will go away if we just fight the racism, when really the problems are often due to all sorts of things today, even if they were due to racism in the past. It's uh, it's a dangerously oversimplified way of looking at the complexities and the inequities in a society. But yes, and so for example, redlining. This is what I mean by complexity, redlining. Go back to a redlined neighborhood in 1950. Most of the people in it were white. That's something that we don't talk about. Redlining was not as racially targeted as a lot of people seem to almost want it to have been. It was about class. It wasn't, a, it wasn't a, about skin. Nevertheless, a vastly disproportionate number of Black people, proportion of Black people, were caught in these same neighborhoods. And so Black people suffered disproportionately from redlining. Is that the reason today that a certain wealth gap between white and Black people exists? And the answer to that is, to some extent, yes. As always, if you actually look at the numbers, if you distinguish between medians and averages, if you distinguish between regions of the United States, if you distinguish between social class, the wealth gap is not what people say. Nevertheless, once you clean up all of that, certainly the fact that so few Black people could build up equity back in the day and not that you know, long ago, that was a matter of racism. But today, to look at the wealth gap and say, well, this is systemic racism, no, no, the racism was way, way back in the past, the, the, why Black people were disproportionately in the red line neighborhoods. Today, there's an inequity. What do you do about it? Do you give Black people a certain amount of money? Do you give Black people houses? How much of a house? How much money? It's complicated, and that's usually not really what people mean. So what are we talking about that it is racism? That's a very convenient, that's a very odd way of using tense here. Racism did something that created a disparity today. It's, it's subtle stuff, but the way we talk about it makes it all seem much easier than it ever was or is. Yeah, at one point in the book, I mean, you're in, uh, in your late 50s, so you, you were born in 65, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I, I like to say mid fifties, Nick. Mid fifties. I'm sorry. What did I? I'm, I'm speaking for myself. Excuse me. I'm I'm in my pre sixties. So, um, but um, you you write at, at a certain point, and this stuck. Uh, it, it really stuck with me, partly because I'm of a similar vintage. Um, but when you look at American culture in 1960 and 1970 on the issue of race, um, something f really you know, I, I, you know, really amazing happened. There was a massive transformation. Can you talk a little bit about that and why, you know, and then why isn't that kind of, you know, sea change in attitudes as well as laws, mores and things like that doesn't seem to factor in. It's as if we're still talking about things before 1960. Yeah, it's really interesting what happens in America in between those two years, 1960 and 1970, completely different worlds. 1960 is when the two parent family is still a norm, even with, with poor black people. And I'm not saying that we need family values. I'm just saying that that would throw a lot of people in time travel back to 1960. Welfare is a mean spirited little program where you've always got the social worker knocking on the door and you're encouraged not to stay on it for very long. That's what welfare was like. And there's a general idea that how Martin Luther King looked at things was 
the standard and reasonable way of thinking about race. Let's get rid of segregation, view people by the content of their character. Let us show what we're made of, was the idea. You go to 1970 and there's this whole new mood. It's the black power mood. The new idea is we can't do our best because you won't let us, and therefore you have to accept that we won't do our best and that sometimes we'll do our worst. And gradually the notion settles in that doing the worst or not doing your best is almost what black authenticity is because you therefore stand as a totemic demonstration of white racism. 1960, racism is about segregation. By 1970, it's standard in certain circles that racism is still present and indestructible because it's, it's structural. That, that starts then. And because of the, the welfare revolution in 1966, it starts to become regular for people to just stay on welfare with no one concerned about whether they get job training. The knocking on the door gradually dwindles in the early 70s, and it becomes this multi-generational program. It's not anybody's fault. People live from week to week, but that happened. Black America turned upside down between 60 and 70. And I always have to watch out because I was born right in the middle of it. And so it's easy for me to think that somehow before my life is different than before, after. But really, it's just an accident. It's also just an accident that television and film start of being in color right after 1965, but right. there really was a, a change. And I have a nostalgia for a time I didn't know. I think that civil rights up to about 1966 and Stokely Carmichael and people yelling black power and not knowing what it meant, that's where it went wrong. And we're still stuck talking about these things the way those people did. So let me ask you this. Um, you know, the uh, uh, woke activism is, you know, it's fundamentally it's it's a, a, a kind of move or a rhetoric that puts blacks in charge in the sense of they are the people that everybody needs to, uh, you know, discursively, rhetorically, they are the people that everybody has to heal or make whole. They, they're the victims. We owe them something. Um, there's people like Robin DiAngelo, who's white. Uh, I'm glad to see an Italian American getting in on some of this action. Um, but, um, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's mostly for black people. What do black, uh, or first, let me ask you, what do whites get out of subscribing to a kind of, you know, massive meta theory, a meta narrative that makes them virtually irredeemable and, and sinners in the hands of an angry uh, mob at this point? Because when you acknowledge that you are polluted in this way, that you're a sinner, that you're complicit, it makes you goodly. You are morally ahead of the curve and you can share that with other people. It's the beginning of what you could call a religion. It feels good to be ahead of the curve and to preach it, to teach it to other people. And so you feel good. I remember this is not in the book um, and I don't use this anecdote much, but I remember way back in 98, I happened to be at a party. It was in the Bay Area. Little party, and it's about 6 o'clock p.m. The sun is coming in. The, it was, the place looked kind of like your, your place. And we were drinking white wine, and it would, the first new Star Wars movie had come out. And this white guy who's just the type walks in. And I wasn't thinking about these thing, things then, but I remember the impression this guy made on me. He had just seen the movie, and not everybody had seen it yet. And somebody said, I'm going to call his, his name was probably Jason. So, so Jason. You know, how was um, Phantom Menace or whichever yeah, one it was? It. was. And um, oh, he said, oh, yeah, well, I don't know. This Jar Jar Binks, he had, he had an accent. It was like it was like racist, so I don't know. That was just this passing comment, and everybody nodded. And I got the feeling that there were women in the room, and I think that made him kind of attractive. They kind of liked this. And I remember at the time thinking, <laughs> that's not what he got out of this movie. He did not watch that three-hour thing and come away from it thinking that the racism was the most important thing. He's saying this because this makes him look good. That was an early version of this. That has now gone you know, far beyond just this one guy. Now that's a standard attitude among people like him. Well, I mean, can we say, though, that Jar Jar Binks does seem to be a racist stereotype in a movie sure. full of them? <laughs> there's the there's the guy who owns Anakin's mother, who is a big hook nosed, chiseling merchant who speaks <laughs> like he's from the true. Lower East Side from where I speak. This is uh, all true. Yeah. So and I mean, but this is the thing back then. In a way, it was so long ago that people weren't as sensitized to it. Today, I think we would watch that movie and instantly see this. But in 1998, 
it was forced. It was it, he was mm -hmm. trying to seem like he was ahead of a certain curve. And I don't so think he was that's, performing. For I mean, me. he's kind of like a cool hunter or, or, you know, woke act, white, woke, woke activists are kind of like cool hunters where they are, you know, they're the they're Michael Pollan, but for racism rather that than is magic. Precisely mushrooms. it. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Um, and is it also, I mean, would you argue or would, would you agree that it's also because the whites who are most into this never really suffer the, you know, the, the implications of, mm -hmm. yeah, America is irredeemably structurally racist. It's white supremacist. So we're going to make a bunch of other whites who actually don't have any power pay all the costs for, you know, this restructuring of society. Yeah, there's there's a lot of that in that um, you find that this ideology is much less readily embraced by white people who are not comfortable. The idea that they're privileged just because they're white, when often they have trouble with the cops, too, just doesn't come through. To an extent, adopting this religion is something that you do when actually your life is quite comfortable. And that also gets to the black angle of it, because... Many people find it perplexing that a certain kind of Black American stresses victimhood so much, seems to be almost looking for disparities and reason to be in despair about the Black condition, trying to find ever more subtle indications of how racism is abstractly baked into the system, watching the Oscars, just waiting for something to be offended about, no matter who wins and for what. And people wonder why, why are you stressing the victimhood when generally we think that having a positive outlook is better? And we watch black people in the past when lynching is ordinary, trying to be optimistic, trying to be constructive, wanting Black people's accomplishments to be focused upon in the media, etc. It's only after the late 60s that the idea settles in that the authentic Black position is to stress the worst, is to portray impediments as conclusive obstacles. All of that is part of the new mood, and people wonder why. And it's not because of power. It's because it assuages a damaged soul. If there is a sense that it can be hard to have Black pride because Black people were treated so badly for so very long, then one way that you can have a substitute pride is to be the noble victim. That's a human type. It's not anything you need to I mean, people. were people like Stokely Carmichael, who uh, is, you know, the I guess he's generally regarded as the person who came up with the idea of Black power, uh, or the phrase, or popularized it, and uh, later to move to Ghana. Um, but... I mean, were they noble victims or were the Black Panther Party, you know, another group that is very much part of the, the real change in, in kind of um, posture among Black activists, certainly different than Martin Luther King. Mm -hmm. um, were they victims or weren't they trying to be like, no, we are assertive, you know, Black men, especially. Stokely Carmichael is famous for saying that the woman's, the woman's place in the movement is prone. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, they don't strike me as, as being victim-y. <laughs> victim <-y. laughs> I know what you mean. But their idea was that our charisma comes from saying that white people are trying to hold us down. And the crucial thing about Stokely Carmichael was, I think personally, he was not a victim-y kind of soul, but the message had nothing to do with doing real things. That's another difference between 1960 and 1970. Martin Luther King had certain goals. Then someone like Rustin had other goals that were less large grain than just getting rid of segregation, but he had definite goals in terms of how to get poor Black people jobs, what to do with the school system. It all seems very wonky, and these were the stars. It's after 1970 that you have people getting together at big Black conferences, for example, and talking about things. But you read about the conference, and what you see is that there was an awful lot of performance, but nothing came of it, no particular program that was brought to the powers that be. People just came together and said, we're powerful as a statement against the powers that be that supposedly were trying to hold them down. But that was considered the essence. Everything was considered complete just in going, woo, that was post-1970. So that's victimy. Yeah. You know, that's, and, that's and taking pride in your victimhood. Is it, I mean, what, is it fair to say, or would you agree that um, also a, a lot of the, the activism that came after that, rather than saying, okay, we're going to, we're going to, you know, kind of a, um, uh, um, 
uh, Booker T. Washington, we're going to build our own schools, we're going to do our own stuff. It was more, we're going to get together and then petition the government to implement a bunch of programs that will help our community. Yeah, the problem is that if you think about Black history from, say, the Panthers, once the Panthers eclipse, then you go to roughly, to tell you the truth, Hurricane Katrina, what was going on in Black history then? And what was going on was an awful lot of very smart, very well-intentioned people saying, you must lower the barriers of competition for us. You must not expect us to perform even the way Black immigrants do. And so it's the era, for example, of affirmative action, which in itself is a great thing, but do you institute it forever? And does it ever become about socioeconomics rather than race? It's interesting how little happened. And then you get a Black president. And after that, here in the 2000 teens, I think the Black history books are going to pick up because then you have the protests against police malfeasance and police murders, et cetera. But what happened? Something really went off the rails after the charisma, the dashikis of Stokely Carmichael. He goes to Africa and the Black Panthers, who predictably flame out. Nothing after that. I, th I wish it could have been better. With uh, you mentioned Obama and, and the Obama presidency, there's a, you know, kind of fascinating changes in polling data of, of how important is race to outcomes in American life or how big a role does racism play? White and black races or, you know, uh, white attitudes towards blacks, et cetera. Um, and things intensify, uh, you know, by the end of the Obama years, there is much more racial animosity. Blacks, uh, you know, according to Gallup and Pew, Blacks feel that racism has become a bigger issue in their lives. A lot of whites agree. Um, liberal whites actually show uh, routinely that they believe racism is much more of a factor in black people's lives than the average black person does. What happened? Uh, you know, because one of the readings of this is that in America, um, you know, we elected a black president or, you know, a half black president. But, um, you know, that created a backlash, a racist backlash where we were, you know, we couldn't take having a black man in charge and America became more racist. Do you give any credence to that kind of narrative? None, none whatsoever. And, you know, that's what they're going to make plays about. That's what the mythology is always going to be. What happened was um, two things. One was social media. And this is something that people forget. Obama starts being president in 2009. And then comes the Tea Party, and everybody thinks that that's because of his race or mostly because of his race. But I always ask, if John Edwards, with his pretty boy white self, but you know, basically the same policies as Obama, if he had become president, would there have been no Tea Party? Would the Republicans have been nicer to John Edwards than Obama? And some people immediately say, oh, yeah, but I'm not sure they could defend why they're so sure. I don't really think it would have been any different. The Tea Party happened the way it did because in 2009, Twitter became default, as did Facebook. Those things completely changed the contours of our lives, even more than cell phones did. So there was that. Then also, from the vantage point of history, it's becoming clear that in the 2000 teens on the American race scene, two things happened. Trayvon Martin's murder and then Michael Brown's murder. Okay. And those two things taught educated America and beyond that black people labor under the threat of being unjustifiably killed by stray or racist white cops. And the saddest thing in the world is, and I really mean this is sad, is that it's become quite clear over the passage of time that the way both of those events were portrayed was complete myth. And I was behind the people protesting both of those cases in the press at the time. I now feel fooled, just like we all feel fooled by, bless his heart, Colin Powell. What happened to Trayvon Martin was not that he was killed unjustifiably by George Zimmerman. It was a, it was an unfortunate episode, but Trayvon Martin was also a very different person than we're led to think. And then also with Mike Brown, it was a lie. It was just a complete lie. For reasons we'll never know, he kept on charging at that police officer. The idea that Darren Brown just shot this guy dead with his hands up in the air is, is, is false. And yet those two things had an awful and, and lot I, to do. I'll just uh, point out that uh, Obama's Justice Department, uh, headed by Eric Holder, himself African-American, actually did an exhaustive investigation of the Michael Brown killing and came to the conclusion that you just yep. uh, articulated. And yet the myth will never die. I hear black men on the street talking about Mike Brown to this day. Hands where, up, you know, don't just, shoot. 
on some level that yeah. happened. There's going to be a movie, I'm sure. Where Having they'll... said that, I mean, it was useful, I think, uh, the Brown uh, incident in particular. It did kind of reveal a system of peonage that whole communities, particularly poor communities, uh, often disproportionately black, were held under when you look at places like Ferguson, where, you know, the, the tickets, the amount of tickets that, that cops would give out for speeding and other kinds of violations to uh, gin up their own uh, budget. That was a useful outcome. Yeah, that was real. And there are things, there are times when something is going on, there's a racial disparity where it really does need to have the whistle blown on it. And so, for example, stop and frisk in New York City had gone way way too far. Right. I wrote about that often, made a lot of people mad. Yeah, you can't you can't wish that away. There just comes a time when you have to get rid of any ideology you might have. Yeah, that that had to go. And with Ferguson, yeah, you learned about how unjust just policing in general and all the fines being levied were. But the thing is, the level of fury, the level of property destruction that happened in Ferguson was about Mike Brown. The level of destruction and fury was not about people getting a lot of tickets and spending a night in jail. There could have been a more constructive way of addressing those things. Or if it is that the only way that we can get at those real things is to tell a big lie about one, that's really a sad way of looking at how sociopolitical change has to happen. You uh, write in the book about, um, and I and I want to try and understand this a little bit better because I'm not, I'm not sure I was getting it fully. Um, you write about how blacks have a damaged sense of self based on, you know, centuries of uh, just you know unfair treatment and whatnot, and that that leads them to be more likely to adopt a kind of noble victim status. Can you mm -hmm. talk a little bit about that because it. Uh, you know, I, I and, and the reason why I ask this is because it seems to me that a lot of um, the rhetoric of black empowerment, and this is going back to even people like Booker T. Washington, but certainly more recently, is about, you know, act, not not struggling vainly, but actually overcoming things and accomplishing things. And I think about it in other and I realize there are, you know, serious differences between other immigrant groups and blacks. But um you know, it, it seems there's a lot of similarities and that it's, you know, it's, you know, ascendant groups valorize success, not failure. Mm -hmm. But you seem to be saying that blacks are kind of stuck in a permanent failure mode. Yeah. And only for about the past 50 years. That was not the case until the sea change that we talked about in between 60 and 70. But yeah, it's that and I don't want to make it sound too poetic about the damaged Black soul. It can be hard to have pride in Black history. It's one thing to say some things about Sojourner Truth, et cetera, but it's another thing to perhaps think, wow, there was all of this destruction, there was this pain, families were broken up, we were always down on the bottom, and we tried and we tried. That can be a hard history to be as proud of as we might like. So one way to feel proud is to say that we are people who survive while we're dealing with white racism all the time. So what there is to be proud of about being black is that we're survivors, that we work under a burden that other people don't. I find that perfectly natural. And it means that what you're doing technically is embracing the victimization mindset, which is just you know the, the tattletale person. But if it can make you feel good, and if it can give you a sense of group membership, then you'll do it. Only, though, does this make sense when you're not really a victim. This is something that is especially embraced by Black people who really pretty much have it all taken care of. And then you can pretend that, for example, you endure racism every day, every day, every day, as I see people putting on Facebook. Now, no, you probably don't. But it makes you feel good to cast yourself as somebody who labors under that kind of a burden. Humanity is a weird thing. And that's, and that's what you see with Black yeah. people of that type. And that persists even in a culture where, you know, black culture is, is you know, in many of its kind of uh, manifestations is idolized in American culture. Um, you know, people want to be black in a way that I, among white ethnic groups, I think only Irish people actually come close to that. Uh, there's I've met a lot of white people and even some black and Asian people who want to be Irish if they can mm -hmm. pick their ethnicity. Um, but 
you know, blackness is actually often sought after or, or at least, you know, various kinds of uh, aspects of it. Yeah, the usual suspects find that inconvenient. And so they'll say that it's only superficial, that it's about music and speech styles and, you know, the arts to an extent, but that still we have the problem with the cops, still we have the problem with the wealth gap, et cetera. And that's not a ridiculous point, but I do think that we tend to miss because it's been so subtle that the culture is much browner than it used to be. And the idea that America is united in a kind of hatred and contempt for blackness that really doesn't correspond to our modern situation um, these days. For example, I very minor example, I was listening to the cast album of the musical Annie in the car yesterday because I had my six and nine year old girls in the car. You are just throwing your privilege at <laughs> me in lower Manhattan without a car or without daughters for that matter. See, but, I've got okay. Too. So I live in where, where does this car. take us? Where does the story go? This is going to go that the girl who played Annie in 1977 is this very white girl and she's chirping. And I remember thinking it's interesting <laughs> that Annie now lives with almost the default choice being for any national Annie, that Annie is brown. At this point, there has been a black Annie on TV and nobody batted an eye. And you kind of figure, why not? She's an orphan. It's it's the depression. Yeah. It makes yeah. sense. And I was thinking that was not the case 30 years ago. No black Annie. That would have been completely bizarre. You know, That's from the a, sort of thing. From a libertarian point of view, of course, uh, the, the take on Annie is Daddy Warbucks is the hero because he hates Franklin Roosevelt. Right. So, you know, <laughs> as right. did the creator of the cartoon of the comic strip. How, I didn't know he did too. How hmm. did um uh how did um how does any of this factor into also the like what is blackness at this point because it's not as if multiracial you know, I mean, you know, there are vastly more interracial couples. Uh, your children, I believe, are of mixed race, right? Mm -hmm. And yeah. uh, which is like a horrible white, phrase white, black. to say. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so how will they see themselves or, you know, have have we loosened up categories? It was in the late 90s for the first time that the U.S. Census actually allowed a kind of other and multiracial category um, without kind of, you know, de you know, horrible kind of um, uh, motivations behind it. But, it, you know, is blackness um, as tight a category as it used to be, or shouldn't we be in a phase now where we're all, I mean, we're, everybody's doing 23 and me, and we're, we're understanding that we're made up by many different types of people. How does that kind of thing intersect with the current discussions of blackness and, and wokeness? Well, why this gets tricky is because there's a certain kind of person who, because of this thing that I'm calling a religion, is hopelessly devoted to the idea that the essence of blackness is laboring under this oppression from whites, even if it's abstract. And you have to show that you know that racism exists. And so you have to you have to insist that brown people are enduring it, even if they don't know it. But the reality is that especially as we start producing new generations, those category memberships are going to have to fray. And I come from we come from a time when the mixed kid was mixed, the idea was that they were going to have to accept as they got older that they were black, in effect. And that made sense in 1975. There was less room to maneuver in the culture. That's not true now. And I think some people hearing me say that are thinking that I mean that I don't like blackness or that I'm ambivalent about it. But I just think that the category is beginning to not make sense. And that includes with my daughters. I don't know if they, when they're 40, are going to identify as black women as opposed to just mutt women growing up in an upper middle class world where everybody is a different flavor and you know what they're basically just becoming is you know modestly affluent american urban kids and i think to myself of i'm not going to say who it was but an actress who is white black a very prominent actress was doing an interview where she um, talked about having an opportunity to express her blackness in a certain setting. And the truth is with this actress that she plays racially indeterminate characters. They're often supposed to be Italian. You don't, she doesn't read as African American in any particular superficial way. And I remember thinking, I wonder what she thinks of as this blackness that she expresses. And I worry these days, and I don't know anything about her, I don't know her personally, but I worry these days that when people say blackness, what they mean is roughly 
not being buttoned up like Episcopalian whites, that blackness means that you turn it out, so to speak, but many people can be expressive. I worry that blackness is thought of as roughly jamming, that, and, I'm, and I mean this as more than just dancing, but that there's something that Black people are in touch with in terms of rhythm, and that it's that, and that Blackness is not being too exact. And we're seeing that in so many educational materials, and I think it runs throughout the culture. To be Black is to not be precise, is to not be responsible for getting the exact answer. You're, you're holistic. You, you have a rhythm. You jam. You don't sit in one place. It's about the beat. Which, and I worry that yeah. that Blackness is primitive, you know? Yeah, well, and you, I mean, you, you uh, underscore this point at various uh, uh, passages in the book, but I mean, it's as if what has being essentialized now is kind of the worst uh, stereotypes of blackness from 100 years ago. So Strom Thurmond would love this stuff. Yeah. And now people are talking about it and using the word intersectionality. Do I don't you see think that much Strom difference. Thurmond's daughter, his black daughter, does she identify as multiracial? You know, that was a very interesting case because I think she was perfectly normal and the black punditocracy did not know, know what to do with it. Strom Thurmond basically disavowed her and left her this, you know, as you used to say back in the day, mulatto person who lived her life. She was a teacher and she, she got past it. She lived her life. Every it, Finding out about her around the year 2000, a certain kind of black person was waiting for her to say that her life had been indelibly stamped and ruined by this white man who produced and then didn't want to avow his paternity of her in public. But she just kind of thought, I'm a human being, I'm living, and she probably had some awkward encounters here and there, but she wasn't living by it. And luckily, I get the feeling she didn't strike me as a, an especially self-aware person, so she couldn't even pretend. She's just being herself and wondering why everybody's paying so much attention. I think that's the normal way people deal with trauma, is, as opposed to what we're encouraged to do today. Yeah, uh, talk a little bit about that. I mean, how much of the kind of racial discourse is is part of this larger? Um, yeah, I don't know if it's valorization or you know, kind of uh, belief and uh, in trauma that everything is trauma. I mean, it seems as if. Uh, you you talk about surviving and the minimal self uh, from the early 80s. Christopher Lash has a passage about how the term survivor slipped out of uh, post-war concentration camp narratives of people who survived, you know, death camps in Nazi Germany and some gulags. And then by, you know, by the end of the 60s, it had become ubiquitous for everything. Um, uh, Betty Friedan talked about um, being in an affluent, you know, a, a, a suburban housewife was in a, you know, a form of concentration camp. Uh, survivorship had gone from being something specific to the Holocaust to something more general. Obviously, black history in America has multiple Holocausts or things that are equivalent to it. But, you know, we're in an age now where being a survivor, being traumatized and reliving that trauma and kind of making people around you aware of your trauma seems to be very much how we talk about things. Um, does that is that prior to the black discussion or how is it informing it? The black discussion goes right along with that. There were psychologists who started doing sessions with, between white people and black people where white people's responsibility was to sign on to the idea that they were creating what we're now calling trauma among black people. And that now lives on in the model of diversity <laughs> DEI initiatives right. that Robin D'Angelo is part of in her book, White Fragility. And yeah, it starts out as a useful way to call attention to the fact that people are hurting. It's an analogy. So of course, somebody who's been teased in school hasn't suffered the way somebody did in the Holocaust, but you can say that both people are survivors. But once that settles in and people stop processing it as extreme, you do have this usage of the term, kind of like the way we use the term racism, that stops being really terribly useful and sometimes can be almost manipulative and even destructive of a person, because if you are instructed to think that whenever somebody hurts your feelings a little bit, you've suffered a trauma and you're a survivor, well, if that's the way you're going to feel about it, you're not going to enjoy life very much unless you basically live in a basement or are an astonishingly boring person. Stuff is going to happen to you. And we now teach that you're not, you're not supposed to just brush yourself off. You're supposed to call attention to yourself as a victim. And that's supposed to be okay because people are, dis especially when people are descendants of African slaves. I'm not sure I see the logic in it, but that's what we're being told. 
Uh, let's talk about uh, your uh, the sections of the book where you d- you don't merely kind of uh, piss on you know woke activism, woke racists. You talk about um, ways to you know make things better for Black Americans, um, mm-hmm. uh, and at, at a certain point. You suggest three planks to make America better, uh, and they are simply end the drug war, teach reading properly, and get past the idea that everyone should go to college. Let's run through these quickly. Um, you know, first, uh, end the drug war. How is that, you know, why do you say that's a concrete thing that will actually help black Americans? Because it'll eliminate the black market that you can make half of a living on. If there's no black market selling hard drugs on the street, you can't do that. You can't drop out of school and do that. You can't do that after high school. There's no way to avoid getting some kind of legal work. And that's not always going to be fun when you're from an underserved community because life is hard. And if you've grown up somewhere where you aren't taught well and you aren't taught how to do anything, you've got a problem, which means that not only do you end the drug war because it destroys Black communities by creating that Black market temptation that sends people to prison and often to death, But then you also want to have something to catch those men. Those men should be caught in a system that cherishes and funds and values vocational education, with the idea being that that person, instead of keeping the wolf from the door by selling drugs and not being sure what he's going to do next year, will learn how to fix air conditioners and heaters and make a thoroughly middle class living for the rest of his life. So that's so that. that's getting past the idea that everyone should go to college. Um, yes. Yeah. Yeah. No, the idea that what that person needs to do is after high school, go spend four years expanding their mind in ways that we know, frankly, don't much expand the minds, even of most of us. That needs to go. College is something that should be a choice for some people, the way it was before 1945 and the GI Bill. The default for I suspect what most people would rather do is after high school, go train for a career, just go right into it and go do it. And if you want to go to college later in your life, that should be allowed, but it shouldn't be considered the default rite of passage. I cringe whenever I hear anybody talking to an audience about poor people and saying that college needs to be made more available. No, vocational school needs to be more available. Would you be okay if your daughters say, Hey, you know what, dad, I, uh, you know, you're pretty smart, but you're boring. I, I want to be an air conditioning repairman. <laughs> you know what? I'd have to adjust to it. But as long as they were going to make a living and they were going to be good at it. Yeah, definitely. All of us probably when we have working people come to our houses, fixing stuff, you marvel at their skill. Somebody who fixes your car, especially with cars being what they are nowadays. There's nothing undignified about that. Yes, of course, I expect my girls to go to college and get degrees after that and become me. But no, I would be if one of them said I want to be an electrician, and I'm going to wire houses. Sure, that's it's practically an art. Yeah. Um, talk a little bit about the uh, teaching read, uh, teach reading properly, because this I, I totally agree with the uh, concept. But uh, how did you come <laughs> up with that? As because there are only three things you say, this well, is what things. we'll do. You know, this is what will help, uh, you know, most in a most cost effective way, black America teach reading properly. Yeah, teach it properly. The reason that sounds so wonky, and I think it sounds like I must have some sort of particular commitment to pedagogy or small children in school. Are you, are you, are you ha- are invested in hooked on phonics 3.0 or something like that? Something like that. It yeah. or something. It's not that, it's that. I know from for various almost random reasons that something that keeps kids, especially ones not from book lined homes, from engaging with school is being taught reading wrong. It started with the whole controversy over whether Ebonics should be used in the schools in Oakland in 1997. And if you really, if you were part of that controversy, you learned about problems with reading teaching in general that would lead anybody to think that the issue was black dialect, that that wasn't the problem. But right. the problem and, was- and you, wrote, you wrote a whole book mm-hmm. basically showing that black dialect is like a really effective form of communication. That, and I also wrote another book back then saying that black dialect is not the reason that poor black kids have trouble learning to read standard English, is that they weren't being taught to read right at all. And so if you've got a good phonics program, you've got a kid who will not, around eight years old, turn away from school because they just find reading too difficult. And like I say in the book, I'm not sure how many people have the experience who are reading this book of knowing somebody who's about 25 years old 
grew up, you know, the hard way, or maybe even just slightly hard way. And I've known black people like this. There are white people like it too. They weren't my acquaintances, but somebody where you're at the, re the restaurant and, and they're moving their lips when they read the menu because it's hard. And, you know, menus are tough to read. And here they are having about as much of a challenge with the menu as most of us would have if the menu is all in French or Spanish. Like we know the language pretty well, but you really don't want to read that much of it. And you look at somebody like that and almost always it's somebody who went to a school where they basically just threw some kid books at them and had them take it in by osmosis. That's not how you teach people how to read. And so it really worries me because disproportionately black kids suffer from that. So I really do think have kids learn to read so they're less likely to drop out of school. Then you have them when they leave school, no black market within the neighborhood where you hang out with the buddies. And, you know, that's I completely understand why people would choose that. But that shouldn't be available. And then what should be available is good, solid vocational training so that they can go out into the world and lead the kinds of productive lives that often their grandfathers did. I'm modeling this on Black communities in big cities in, say, 1949. That was no paradise by any means. But most Black men worked legal jobs. It was better. That so was better. Do you, I mean, do you think that the, the issues with kind of black achievement, for lack of a better term, it's really that black men are not are not holding up their end of the bargain? Well, I wouldn't say they aren't holding up their end of the bargain because they are, you know, just actors within a system where they're modeling their behavior upon one another's. I have a hard time seeing assigning blame in a situation like that. You speak the language you know. You, If you grow up with men doing or not doing certain things, big surprise, you're going to be like them. It's not, it's not your fault. But I think that there does need to be a focus on what happens to especially men in poor Black communities. The women in question have fewer problems in that sense. We need to focus more on childcare. That's something that I could add as a fourth point. But with the women, the employment issue is less of an issue because the typical woman in a community like that does not sell drugs on the side. That is a male dominated activity. And I should say, it's not that most men in those communities sell drugs on the side, but enough do that it affects the whole tenor of the community. Um, what are uh, the rhetorical and discursive strategies for dealing with the elect, uh, as you call them? Because this is <clears throat> also something, and I, I've heard you speak about this in public settings as well. Um, you know, you you have some pointers because you say you're not going to convince, you know, you're not going to be able to have a really good uh uh, you know, meal with uh, with Robin D'Angelo and get her to be like, hey, you know what? I was kind of wrong about this stuff. So how do you what's the best way to deal with it? Yeah, I it's hard. I felt bad writing this in the book, but there's a certain kind of person who thinks that battling power differentials is supposed to be central to everything that we do and think. That's what all of this is. The power differentials for them are usually about race, but the idea is that those power differentials exist, and until they don't, everything else is fiddling while Rome burns or it's unjust to focus on it because we must battle these power differentials. That kind of person, if you disagree with them, calls you a white supremacist, and nowadays they can do it on social media. So that's what they're going to do. They are no more to blame than the black man in the underserved community who sells drugs on the side. It's what they see. They're upset and they're gonna say it on social media just like all of us say all sorts of things on social media. They haven't taught this to one another, but they're gonna call you a white supremacist. There are two things that we have to do. One is we have to get used to being called that name and walking on instead of thinking that to be called a racist on social media stains us like Hester Prynne. And two, that kind of person needs to be told no. I think a lot of us, especially since June 2020 and George Floyd, have thought that when that person comes along talking about social justice and hegemony and intersectionality and tells you that we're going to change all of our procedures, and if you disagree, we're going to call you names on social media or get you fired or push you out the window, our job is to say yes, because if we don't say yes, there must be something wrong with us. No, that kind of person needs to sit down, not leave. They need to sit back down at the table where they were. And that means that, for example, the most illustrative one of my vignettes, I think, 
is suppose you have a group of people, maybe students, maybe faculty, who think that your school should be turned into an anti-racism academy with that permeating every subject, permeating how admissions are done, permeating how hirings are done, and even necessitating possibly the firing of people who work And there. even how people respond in class, who gets exactly. called on things yeah, like and that. Yeah, this, right? this has happened in some schools. Yeah. The people calling for that need to be told no. They don't need to be abused, but just, no, we don't agree with you that battling power differentials should be the center of our endeavor here. It'll be one of about a dozen things that we do. It will not be the center. And if you don't like it, you have to leave. And I don't care what you call me. That kind of person would be really thrown by being stood up to in that way. And they, they will go on Twitter and they will yell white supremacist. And if you just stand your ground, then I think we can return things to the way they were to <laughs> glorious years ago. The hard, hard left, even despite how mean they can be, are needed in this room. We, are need, we need to see where we could go. But these things happen slowly. And what they're doing is saying, because George Floyd was killed and there's a racial reckoning, we get what we want. And if we don't get what we want, we're going to call you terrible names in public. The response to that is no. They're not any more right than anybody else has been who thought they had the solution to everything. Although they, they are remarkably effective. I'm thinking back to, I guess it was last summer or maybe, yeah, I think it was 2020 when Princeton University essentially, uh, you know, the president of Princeton University said, hey, you know what, we are like an, you know, unbelievably racist institution. Uh, weirdly, the Trump education department called their bluff and said, if you are that racist, we have to investigate you and look at you know pulling federal funding from you. You're that like a segregation academy. The one good thing for me that came out of the Trump administration was that move because it showed how utterly fake a lot of this stuff is. And Princeton, unfortunately, has been the site of an egregious amount of performance on this kind of issue where there are people who need to be told simply no. Uh, John, as two Rutgers men talking, I think we can appreciate <laughs> or we can agree that Princeton gets whatever it deserves. They you know, do. They, and they, they, they should have <laughs> twice as bad outcomes. Who are your, um, you know, you are a linguist by trade. Who are your heroes in linguistics? Uh, and then who are your heroes in kind of your, you know, as you write more about broader kind of social issues, uh, particularly dealing with blackness? Uh, you know, who are, who are the people who, who inspired you to, to start thinking the way you do? Shelby Steele is the person who changed me mm -hmm. um, on race issues because he showed me that you can feel the way I do and not be crazy. He really, that was my inspiration. Um, in terms of who inspires me otherwise, it's not, it's not the list that many people would expect. I know I'm supposed to give this noble list of black writers it's not, it's not it. I really like James Baldwin. I believe I've read everything he ever wrote. So I can definitely say that. And that's not display. That is the truth. But my other favorite writers are Jacques Barzan, the super duper polymathic intellectual. I'm glad to say he was at Columbia, just how much he knew and how gracefully he expressed it. And Stephen Jay Gould, you know, he he had his lapses just as we all do, but I loved his writing. I loved the way he thought. I've read almost everything that he ever wrote, except for that long one that nobody reads. But other than that, yeah, those them. And in linguistics, linguistics is a weird little field. I have my favorite linguists. They're not famous. Um, I would not say that Noam Chomsky was one of my favorite linguists, but some of the best ones include people like Marianne Methune and, and Scott Delancey. I'd say I'm, I'm going to rattle off these people that are not known outside of linguistics. But, but I have now the their reputations will suffer by being associated with you forever. <laughs> I'm so you see, I'm, do I'm doing the them. woke mobs work for them. But, you know, actually, um, Steven Pinker is, you know, has always been one of my gods in that department. Another linguist who I really admire, although she doesn't always think I'm right, is um, Sarah Thomason. There, there are many who I model myself after, but th they tend not to be the ones that you see you know, making national headlines. Um, to go back to Baldwin for a second, he's he's a fascinating character who fell out of fashion. I mean, he was a, a huge cultural figure in the 50s and for a chunk of the 60s, he was eclipsed by, you know, black power radicals. Uh, you know, Eldridge Cleaver in the beginning of Soul on Ice and one of really one of the most despicable, homophobic, uh, just awful kind of 
essays, you know, literally or figuratively rather, you know, sodomizes James Baldwin because he says that's all Baldwin did. He just bent over for Western culture and whiteness. Um, is Baldwin as relevant or, or rather not as he is relevant, but does there need to be his critique of American society, which I find, you know, incredibly powerful for when he was writing it? Is it time also to recognize that his, the power of his writing, you know, it, it's in the past. It doesn't really describe contemporary America. I find him to be the most compelling, most talented and in his way, most polymathic describer of the way it used to be. So whenever I read him, I think this is the way people today seem to think it still is. But this is somebody who actually lived that America. And I like his general curiosity. He, he spread out wide. He thought for himself. Um, I don't think he's always right, but he is a genuine thinker. And he was not interested in that cleaver idea of whiteness as something to reject out of hand with the notion that true blackness is partly this sort of hyper masculinity. That, that whole thing is a perfect example of the sea change between 1960 and 1970. And one of the saddest pieces is where Baldwin writes about the response from Cleaver and he's hurt. He's surprised. He would have thought Cleaver would have been his brother. And instead, all Cleaver could see was you know, this fey little man who likes old white books. That was unfortunate. And that was the new flavor of the times then. Do you think, and I, and I say this with your uh, with your daughters in mind and other, peop other younger people who are multiracial, do, I mean... Is there a way to kind of invoke an American ideal? Uh, you know, maybe it shouldn't be American, maybe it should be universal, but that what is interesting to, you know, kind of update Krev Kors, you know, what then is this new man, this American, to, you know, actually that a, an American is anybody who lives in America and is an amalgamation of a lot of different uh, forces, a lot of different races, a lot of different ethnicities and experiences into you know, really kind of celebrating the fact that we're all mongrels, uh, that we're all mutts. I mean, do we need that kind of new ideal to kind of pull past, you know, what seems over the past 10 years to be a real regression into old finite categories that, you know, most of American history we were, we were trying to get past, but now we seem to be locked into those. Americanness is a challenge because on paper, it's wonderful to say that we're going to be mongrels and we're going to be defined by these abstract principles. But in real life, people are tribal. People want something to celebrate and to, to yawp about, as I've seen it put, Y-A-W-P. Yeah. And so part of what we see in the Black identity is that you want to have something to rally around. And for Black America, a lot of that is rallying around being victims of white oppression and therefore a success story in a way because we do what we do despite all of this oppression. That is partly because Americanness alone can sometimes seem too abstract. But for a lot of Black leaders, Black think thought leaders, the idea that we would just think of ourselves as Americans doesn't work because we're supposed to primarily think of ourselves as living in danger of being mauled by the police, living in danger of being hurt by a micro aggression. And I think that's not healthy, especially given that these things are so much less extreme in their force for most of us than they were, say, 50 years ago and before. But yeah, American first, Black second. For many Black thought leaders, that's disloyal and naive. You should think of yourself as black first, and the Americanness is kind of an abstraction that you mostly feel when you go to Africa. No, nah, I think it's a pose these days. I think we need to reverse it again. Um, you are not yourself insulated from, uh, you know, for lack of a better term, cancellation, right? You um, uh, you write in the book that uh, you know various people will look at you and just be like, oh well, you, you're you're insulated. You can say what you're saying, knowing that you'll never really suffer consequences. But that's not quite true, right? You're not tenured faculty at Columbia. You're not in a mm -mm. tenure situation there. Mm -mm. And you are um, you were recently hired at the New York Times, uh, mm -hmm. which is kind of a sign that maybe the Times isn't as monolithic as you think. But I, I mm -hmm. assume that you, uh, you know, you got to wonder when is uh, uh, Nicole Hannah Jones <laughs> going to finally get you fired? <laughs> well, there are things we're not allowed to talk about, and so I have to be circumspect. But I am always aware that the mob could come for me. They certainly could come for me. The color of my skin might help me a little bit, 
but it would only help me so much. And I'm prepared. I could lose jobs. However, as far as I'm concerned, for one thing, just mystically, I have a way of landing on my feet. I have been for about the past 30 years. But even if I didn't, I would rather sell pencils on the street or have to live on somebody's couch than not say what I have to say. I really do feel at this point that I have a duty because when I first started writing about race, I was 30 and people would say that I was too young to have any authority. Not only am I just a linguist, but what does he know? He's only been alive 30 years. If I were 80, it would be that I'm from another time and I don't know what's going down right now. If I'm 56, I'm right in between. And so part of the reason I wrote Woke Racism, I started it when I was 55, I guess, is that I thought, I had it, one, I'm black, two, I'm middle-aged, three, I think these things. I have to write this book right now. And yeah, I could not have it that my words weren't out there. And Lord forbid anybody meet me thinking that I think the way, you know, Ibram Kendi, et cetera, think, which is an assumption that was often made about me before I came out, so to speak, reasonably, you know, most me's do think that way. So yeah, I, the mob has come for me around the edges. Some little things have happened within linguistics that don't matter, but yeah, I am not immune. It could happen to me anytime. I'm always aware of it, which is part of why I'm working myself to death because I'm kind of insulating myself from the disappearance of one of those jobs. But I get the feeling I'm going to be here for a while. Well, um, I, I think we'll leave it there. I want to thank uh, John McWhorter for talking to Reason. I also, I think John Edwards wants to thank you for reminding people that he existed and that he might even <laughs> still be alive. I'm not I sure off the footnote. top of my head. <laughs> but uh, John McWhorter's uh, new book is Woke Racism, How a New Religion Has Betrayed Black America. John, thanks for talking to Reason. Thank you, Nick.